right. So, uh, for those of you who are here for the first time or since the beginning of the year, these are our journals. Uh, first quarter journal. Uh, we're in a year-long series to be better, to get better as individuals, as a community, and then to influence our community uh, for the glory of God. So we're in a, a, a journey, on a journey towards being better. These are our physical journey, journals. Uh, we also have, for those of you who are aware of our website, spbaptist.org, uh, we have a PDF file of the journal, so you can download a PDF file. Uh, and then we also have a St. Paul app, which is the easiest way, I think. Uh, you can download the St. Paul app, and the journal is available under Better Journal, week eight. So we're in week eight of our Better Journey, week eight of our Better Journey. How many of you are thankful that, man, we're in this Better Journey? Anybody? All right. All right. Making some progress. Making some progress. Okay. So we're going to have a survey coming out just to kind of see how we're doing, get some feedback from you uh, as it relates to this journey. I want to thank you, those of you who've given me feedback on the journal. Uh, so we've completed the second quarter journal. It will go off to print in a couple of weeks. And uh, thank you for the feedback. Some of you gave me great feedback. Like, man, I don't know what you're talking about in some of those questions. <laughs> I read those questions. I couldn't figure out how to answer them. I didn't have a clue what you were talking about. Thank you for that. Some of you are like, man, can you just make the print a little bit larger? Just, a, just a, if you just move the font up just a little bit, that would really help us. Uh, so we appreciate that. Provide us a little more space so we can actually take our sermon notes. Because you know you give us like 20 points and then you gave us like this much space for your 20 points. Right? So we appreciate your feedback. We've taken your feedback into consideration. Uh, made the necessary adjustments, hopefully. Uh, but we're going to be looking for feedback in quarter two to say, hey, let us know how we did. Because this is for us. Amen? So if it's not a helpful tool, we want to improve it so that it can be a helpful tool because a tool is only helpful if we use it. Can we say that together? A tool is only helpful if we use it. One more time. A tool is only helpful if we use it, all right? So we want it to be a helpful tool, which means that it needs to be a tool that we can use. So in the journal as well, we heard you didn't provide anything for the children to do. You didn't provide any activities for them that were teenage and child appropriate. So we included that in the next quarter journal. Amen? So we're listening to the feedback, and we appreciate it. So we want to encourage you, keep giving us feedback. Uh, as you see the second quarter journal, uh, let us know how we did, and then we'll make another set of improvements. We'll create a journal for each quarter until the end of the year. And then once we get there, we'll celebrate what God has been doing. So I'm excited about the journey. All right? We're on week what? Thank you all. I was like, please don't miss that. <laughs> All right, we're on week eight. What are we talking about today? Talking about what? Self-esteem and the Savior. Okay. Uh, so as we begin today, today is the last Sunday in Black History Month. Uh, we're going to anchor ourselves biblically in Luke chapter 12. Easiest way to find it really is to download a Bible app. Uh, but if you have an actual Bible, go to the table of contents, uh, look and see what page Luke, L-U-K-E, is on. Once you get to that page number, chapters are the large numbers, verses are the small numbers. We're going to be in Luke chapter 12, and we're going to read verses 6 and 7. So that's where we're going to be going once we get there. We're going to be in Luke chapter what? Versus what? Thank you all for taking the journey with me. Okay. All right. So here's how we want to begin. There is a poignant scene from a movie that many people may have seen, some have not seen. It's entitled The Help. It's a movie set in the 1960s that depicts the struggles of African-American maids working in white households in Jackson, Mississippi. One of the characters who is a maid in the movie is Abilene. 
Abilene takes care of her last baby, Mae Mobley. And Abilene, after watching the interaction between Mae Mobley and her mother, an interaction that was not always affirming, that was not always positive, that was not always loving, not mean, not cruel, just not affirming. Abilene would constantly say to Mae Mobley because she saw that she needed it, you is kind, you is smart, you is important. She would constantly say that to her. That was her mantra to Mae Mobley. And there came a point in time where Abilene was leaving. She was done. She had had enough and was being forced out. And there is a teary scene between Abilene and baby Mae Mobley. And she reminds her of this mantra, this, this affirmation that she has been saying to this small child again and again. And she says, remember what I always told you? And Mae Mobley, Hearing again and again that mantra says to Abilene, you is kind, you is smart, you is important. And they separate. Isn't it unfortunate that many children in our day and time don't hear affirming words like you are kind, you are smart, you are important. Isn't it unfortunate that, that many children in our time, they don't have somebody like an Abilene who gives them words of affirmation to help instill within them a level of resilience so that when others won't affirm what's in you because somebody has already deposited it in you, even when you don't get it from other folk, you can remind yourself because the deposit is there. For many of our children, they are experiencing day in and day out the absence of affirmations at home, which are important. It's important for our children to receive affirmation at home because when they don't, they become vulnerable to the cruelty of society, to the meanness of society, to the rudeness of society. When, when children don't have that deposit already placed inside of them, affirming their value, it makes them vulnerable. And this is especially true as we celebrate Black History Month for black and brown children. It's especially true for black and brown children who grow up in a country that historically has devalued them as people. Can we go there? I mean, come on, historically, many of our, our black and brown children, many of us, 50s, 60s, 70s, 40s, right, have, have dealt with the, the, the weight of the society that we live in. And as we think about our history, I want to make the case that it is especially important for us to affirm black and brown children just because of history. What do you mean just because of history? Some of you may be aware that during the era of slavery, in these, as my mentor, Dr. K. Edward Copeland would say, yet to be United States of America, African Americans face profound dehumanization and systemic denial of their rights. Enshrined in the United States Constitution in 1787, was the three-fifths compromise, which reduced enslaved individuals to three-fifths of a person for purposes of representation and taxation. 
Additionally, slave laws explicitly define Africans and who would become African Americans as property rather than human beings, subjecting them to harsh restrictions and brutal treatment. The, the dehumanization we've seen in, in the infamous, or was seen in the infamous Dred Scott decision of 1857. Further, it solidified the dehumanization, denying African American citizenship and asserting our inferiority. Chief Justice Roger B. Taney of the Supreme Court during that time famously wrote in his opinion that African Americans had no rights which the white man was bound to respect and that they were beings of an inferior order. Even after slavery, Jim Crow laws perpetuated racial segregation and discrimination reinforcing the notion of African Americans as inferior. Widespread violence, including lynching, further enforce this dehumanizing narrative, treating African Americans as subhuman and disposable. The civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s saw African Americans fighting tirelessly for their rights and dignity despite facing violence and intimidation and systemic oppression, leaders stood up against injustice demanding equality and respect for all people regardless of race. And I know I've probably made some of you uncomfortable because in your minds it's like, why would you bring this up? This was so long ago. While this seems like a long time ago, many in this congregation, perhaps in this very room, picked cotton and moved from the South during times of oppression. Many, perhaps in this room, online watching, not only heard of, but were aware of lynchings that took place in their communities, experienced separate but not equal school systems, experienced going to a water fountain that had colored only and white only, many experienced not being able to get food going through the front door but having to go to the back door, many experienced not being able to stay in a hotel but having to map out whether or not you had relatives and friends or whether you were going to sleep in a car to be safe because you did not have the privilege of staying at a modern day hotel. Many here experienced what it was like to have to fight and picket and march just to get the opportunity to vote. And because some of you all may think I'm lying then I'll just ask, if you're in the room and you ever were aware of lynching in your community, you went to separate but unequal schools, you had to drink from a water fountain that said colored only, you knew what it was like to go to the back door, you picked cotton, you, you knew what it was like not to be able to stay in a hotel or not to have the right to vote or to have to fight for it and then fight for it and then fight for it and then somehow still miss out on being able to vote if you're in the room and you experience any of that, would you please just stand to your feet? Look around if you will. Those of you online, if you could just put a hand up. You may be seated just for us to see that even though it seems as though that history was so long ago, there are people that we touch week after week, that for them this was their real experience, their real experience of water holes being not just poured on them but fired at them. It was their real experience. And today we continue to grapple with the legacy of racism and discrimination as evidenced by the ongoing battle for social and economic addressing of social and economic disparities within black and brown communities. And despite the progress, many of our children are growing up in this country who are not being affirmed by the country, who are not being affirmed by others for a variety of reasons. So on this morning, as I talk to all of us, I want to 
challenge all of us, but I want to encourage specifically those of us who have influence, children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren who are black and brown. I want to encourage us to do for them what Abilene did for May Mobley. I want to encourage us to affirm them, to affirm to them that you are loved, that you are valuable, that you have a purpose, and you are not alone. That's what I want to affirm. So can we, can we take a few moments and just talk about these affirmations and why they are important? To talk about why it's important for us to make this deposit in the children because affirming children, pouring into children will help them again to be resilient against all the things that they will face. And we want to insulate them, not just based on our conviction, but we want to insulate them and prepare them based on the Word of God. So in Luke chapter 12, beginning at verse 6, Jesus is talking to the disciples. Luke chapter 12 opens up talking about there is a crowd of people who have gathered to hear Jesus. I love that Luke, the writer, says that there are many thousands, that there are a whole bunch of people who have gathered to hear what Jesus has to say. And Jesus, as he talks to this crowd, he gives a warning at first to those who are following him and those who are listening. He tells them, hey, I want to make sure that you don't, you don't act like the Pharisees and, and the religious leaders of the day. I want to encourage you that you don't embrace hypocrisy, that you don't try to put on, you don't play act, but that you be authentic and real. Why? Because God sees you and God knows you. God knows when you're putting on for people and when you're putting on for him and God knows when you are for real. And then from there, he goes on to let them know that, hey, I know it's going to get hard. It's a whole bunch of people listening right now, but please know there's going to come a time when a whole bunch of people are not going to want to hear what I have to say. So when the external pressure begins to grow, he says, I want to encourage you, verse 4, don't you allow your fear of people to cause you not to live for me. Don't you allow the fear of what people can do to you to cause you to step back from being who I called you to be. Instead of fearing people who can only deal with your body, you ought to fear God who can not only deal with you in this life but also in the life that will come. And then after that, he says these words, aren't five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten in God's sight. Indeed, the hairs of your head are all counted. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Jesus wanted them to understand that God cares for sparrows, but he wanted them to understand, more importantly, that God cares for you. And what we want to do on today is affirm for our children that you are valuable because God says you are valuable. We want to affirm for our children that you have a God-given worth that God has placed on the inside of you. We want to teach them through affirmations. So again, here are the four affirmations that we're going to communicate to our children and lest I forget us, we're going to communicate to ourselves that I am loved, I am valuable, I have purpose, and I am not alone. Why would we begin communicating that you are loved? Because it's important for children to know that they are loved beyond measure. That the God who made them not only made them, but the God who made them loves them. That the God who made them loves them with an everlasting love, that he loves them with an unconditional love. It's important for children to know that they are loved by God. And it's important for them to know that the love of God will never change. It's important for us to affirm to children, you are loved by God for who you are, not who you will be, but for who you are. 
You are loved by God because God made you in his image and his likeness. You are loved by God. And the one thing that I want you to know as a child that you can count on when everybody else will fail, if I as an adult turn my back on you, please know God will not turn his back on you. Please know that God will love you until the end. We want them to know that they are loved just for being them, that they have already been embraced by the creator of the universe. And we want them to know that God's love for them is boundless and it's inclusive. It transcends human categories and prejudices. It doesn't matter about the color of your skin or where you come from or your social or economic status, degrees, no degrees, none of that matters in the eyes of God. God loves you because he made you. And isn't it beautiful for a child to hear, God loves me? Just because he made me? Yes, God loves you. Listen to what Jesus says. Jesus says, man, five sparrows are sold for a little bit of money, like pennies. Really, they would sell four for the pennies, and because they were so cheap, they would throw in the fifth one for free. And Jesus says, man, if, if God has concern for the sparrows and they are if insignificant in the eyes of humanity, please know that God values you far more than he does the sparrows. Affirm for our children that they are loved. That is a love that should be celebrated. It is a love of them for their uniqueness, that it is a love that God gives to them freely. But as I thought about this, I thought, man, just saying that verbally doesn't necessarily mean that a child will internalize it. Come on, somebody. Because we say it verbally, and it doesn't necessarily mean that we internalize it. So as I thought about it, I was like, wow, verbal affirmation without practical action is hard to believe. <laughs> right? If, if I verbally affirm something, but I don't practically act upon it or demonstrate it, it's going to be hard for you to believe what I'm affirming verbally if you don't see me live it practically. Right? So, so since that's the struggle, not just for children, but for us, I thought, man, how do, we, how do we help the children that we're going to affirm to tell them God loves you? How do we help them to see and feel God's love? And we do so by modeling it. Mm. So if we're going to affirm our children and tell them that you are loved by God so that they can say, I am loved by God, then for those of us who are affirming it, who are communicating it, then we need to give them affection that demonstrates love. Mm. It's all right. I'm, I'm taking my time today, y'all. We, we're going to give them affection that demonstrates love. Now, here's the challenge. Some of us didn't receive that. Right? And it's hard to give what you don't have. That's why we're trying to get better. Because you understand that if you can't give what you don't have, then you need to go get it so you can give it. Uh-huh. We move from 20 claps to 10. It's all good. Right? Now, here, here's the basic premise. If, if, if I'm struggling in the face of affection, then that means a part of my prayer a part of my commitment and a part of my discipline is God help me to grow in knowing how to give appropriate affection to the children that I encounter. Why? Because in order for me to properly affirm them, I can't just say it, I got to live it. It's all right, I'm going to keep coming for you. Not only giving affection, but I need to give time because time communicates love. I can't send you to the corner all the time with a tablet and a device. Come on, somebody. I, I got to give you time. I, I know you work every day. I know you tired, right? But you're responsible. 
You're responsible. You're the adult. So figure out how to get you some energy, get you a nap in, and give them some time. I can't tell you how much God loves you and how much I love you, and I don't give you no time. But I got time for my TV shows. I got time for my Netflix shows. I got time for my boo, but I ain't got time for you. See, if we're going to give the affirmation that you are loved and they believe it, we got to give affection, we got to give time, and then we have to actually actively listen. Now, now this is hard. Any, anybody, anybody potentially 40 plus, maybe 35 plus, right, actually listening to your kids is hard, right, because our parents didn't care whether we knew they were listening to us or not. Like, can't you just listen, Linda, listen? Like, no, no, no. They, they didn't care. They loved us, but it was not a part of their parenting to sit with us, talk with us, hear how we feel, hear what we think, and then help us to work through that. You better do what I said because I said it. I'm talking to adults, not to you, right? So if that's your background, guess what? We got to learn to actively listen. That's next month. Um, and then here, again, I'm just on the first one, affirming love. If we're going to affirm love and say you are loved by God, and, and the way that you see that you are loved by God is how I love you, then I need to be consistent. I need to be reliable. Love says you can trust me. You can trust that when I say it, I'm going to do it. You can trust that if I say I'm going to be there, I'm going to be there. Love says you can trust me. You can count on me. Isn't that what we celebrate in God? His faithfulness? Love says I will be reliable. So the first affirmation is we're going to say to children, you are loved. And the way we're going to convey that is we're going to demonstrate you are loved. Number two, not only are you loved, but you are valuable. Again, Jesus talks about the sparrows and how cheap they are. And what I appreciated about this is just because humanity places a low price on sparrows doesn't mean God does. Sparrows can be bought for pennies, but God knows and cares for each one of them. Just because humanity and a culture and even a government may not think you valuable doesn't mean God does. God says, I don't care what nobody else says, you are valuable to me. I don't care how anybody else look at you. I don't care what anybody else think about you. I don't care how anybody else feel about you. I'm saying as your creator, not just of you, but everybody around you who got something to say about you, I'm saying as your creator, you are valuable in my eyesight. See, it's important for us to understand how much God values us simply because he made us. So imagine a man, the story is told about a man who is fond of collecting books and uh, he stumbles upon one of his friends who just got rid of, discarded a Bible found in an attic of his family's home. His friend's like, yeah, I got rid of that Bible, you know. Um, And the friend was just oblivious. He was describing the Bible, and he kind of dismissed it. He said, he, he asked me, he said, well, what kind of Bible was it? He said, you know, the Bible had like this name, uh, like Guten something. <laughs> Horrified. The friend who is the book lover exclaimed, not Gutenberg. He said, yeah, that's the name, that's the name that was on it. And then he told his friend, like, you do know that that was one of the first and the earliest printed Bibles, and it's worth millions in auctions. He's like, I didn't know. He said, but it wasn't no good because it it had handwriting from this guy named, like, Martin Luther. (laughs) His friend just lost it, like, what? 
like, are you serious? A Gutenberg Bible with Martin Luther's handwriting? His friend had no idea how significant it was because of whose name was on it and whose writing was in it. I know you can look at the label on your shirt, but you can't look at the label on you. But the label on you says, made in the image of God. Some, somewhere on you, somewhere in your DNA, somewhere it says, made in the image of God. And God says, just that alone causes you to be valuable in my eyesight. God values us because he created us, and our children need to understand that God values them because he created them that they have inherent worth that cannot be taken away. It's not based on anything external. It's not based on accomplishments or achievements. It's based on the fact that they are made in the image and likeness of God. So again, because that sounds good, like, baby, you, you valuable to God. How do we affirm that with something other than words? How do we practically show our children that they are valuable? We remind them in affirmations, you're loved just as you are. When we live that, you're loved just as you are. I'm going to love you when you're good, and I'm going to love you when you act like me. <laughs> right? My consistency of love communicates that I value you because you are you, not because you were good, and I won't value you less because you were bad, but I value you because you are you. How do we demonstrate a value for them? We, we demonstrate value by, by celebrating their inner growth, celebrating when we see empathy in them, celebrating when we see some awareness like oh I probably shouldn't have done that huh that's very good <laughs> like you're still in trouble but great awareness <laughs> great awareness because you you should not have done that being able to celebrate when we see them having a positive attitude and and celebrate when we see them being kind towards others when we see inner growth we celebrate their value and we model self-acceptance and love that does not fluctuate. And we embrace their imperfections because we realize we have imperfections. Ooh, and again, our generation, we weren't taught this. We didn't experience this, many of us, some of us perhaps. Many of us didn't experience this, right? But actually being able to own our imperfections before them. I know it's hard. Y'all like, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> right? Like, you know, the other day when you got in trouble and I did such and such, such and such, I realize now <laughs> that I overreacted. I realize now as I think about how I responded to what you did, that what you did was on this level and my response was on this level. And I bring it up not because I can change anything, but I bring it up because I am fully aware that I am imperfect and I need grace from you. Just like you are imperfect and you need grace from me. All I'm trying to say is we want to affirm to our children you are valuable. So today, tell your children you are valuable. And I want them to say I am valuable. Here's number three because I don't want to hold you all too long. Number three. One affirm for them, you have purpose. You have purpose. Here, here's what Jesus says. Hey, pay attention to the sparrows um, because God cares much more for you than he does them. And understand that as my followers, that you have a mission, that there's something that the Father wants you to do. He actually rescued you for that purpose because he's placed purpose on the inside of you, that he wants to use you for his glory and his honor, and it's important for us to communicate to our children that you have purpose. It's important for us to communicate to them at a young 
age, that there is a reason that God placed you here. When they're frustrated and confused and, and they don't understand themselves and they don't know why they're doing what they're doing and why they're gravitating towards this and gravitating towards that. It's like, just, it's important for us to tell, it's all right, we're going to figure it out because God has given you purpose. I don't know it yet and you don't know it yet, but please know because we know God, we know it's in there. Because God doesn't do anything without purpose. God has a purpose for everything. So we want to affirm to them that you have purpose despite your difficulties and despite any challenges. Please know that God has placed something in you that's bigger than you and it's not just for you. And th this is a this is a Christian voice in a cultural moment. God has placed purpose in you, and the purpose that he's placed in you is not just for you. This is not for you to become successful for you, for you to make money for you. No, whatever God has placed in you, God has placed in you for his glory and his honor. So God has given you purpose so that in whatever you do, you can point people to God, not to yourself. I know, some of us are like, oh, whoa, what you talking about, man? No, purpose for the child of God is always for the glory of God, never for the glory of self. It's always that he might be lifted up and we not be lifted up. We're always humbling ourselves before him. Why? Because only he is worthy to be praised. He is worthy to be honored. He is the only one who deserves, deserves glory, right? So we don't do any boasting in self. Our only boasting is in Christ. And we want to affirm that in our children, that God has placed purpose in you. And as you live out that purpose, you may get a whole bunch of stuff. You may get recognition from the world. But please remember, the purpose that's inside of you is for the glory of God, not for the glory of you. And we want to continue to affirm that so that they don't get off track. And as we affirm that, man, God has created you for his glory and his honor, how do we, how do we practically work that out? Because in case you hadn't noticed, this is, this is like something to help us as parents and, and grandparents and, and people who love children or don't like children but realize we invested in children. How do, how do we practically work that out? How do we how do, we do that? Well, um, one way is we need to pay attention. The Bible, the Bible says that, that God has blessed you with children and, and they're like arrows that you ought to shoot in the right direction. See, God has placed something inside of them, and it's up to us as adults to partner with God to say, God, can you help me to see glimpses of what you put in them? Because I don't want to break what you put in them because of my issues. It's all right, I'm going to keep talking to you. I don't, I, I don't want to destroy what you placed in them because I don't like it. See, you, you placed in them what, what some would call them being stubborn, right? But, but God, you, you caused them to be strong-willed for a reason. God, why, why would you cause them to be strong-willed? I don't want to break it because I don't like it. I want to know how to work with you to refine it so they can know when do you utilize God making you to have strong will. It's good for you not to back down when you have a conviction that you are right. And if God has placed that in you, I don't want to break that. I want that to be released for the glory of God, which means we got to pay attention, which is why we need to spend time with them, because I can't pay attention if I don't spend time with them. I need to be able to observe. When do they have creative ability? And what's their creative ability? And how do I affirm that creative ability? I don't want to send them in the direction that, that I want to send them in because I like certain things. They may not like anything that I like. So we want to pay attention. Not only do we want to pay attention, but we want to expose them. We want to expose them to a variety of things so that they can figure out how God has wired them. We want to expose them to people who can mentor them and coach them so that they can receive from others what they may not be able to receive from us. And as we do that, we begin to see, man, God, I can see you. I can see you work. Oh, this one got some leadership skills. Oh, this one got some strategic skills. Oh, this one is so creative. Oh, this one is a hands-on person. Oh, God, I see it. See, as we pay attention and encourage them to explore and connect them with role models, and then 
Y'all, can we please get back to a place where we encourage our children to serve? <laughs> I know we got children's church. I'm watching children's church there, right? But, but, but can, can we stop raising children who just think that they exist to be served? That the whole world revolves around them and everything comes to them exactly how they want it, exactly when they want it, exactly in the way that they want it. Can we raise children and say, no, it is your responsibility to serve others. Why? You are not the center of your world. God is the center of our world. And the one that we follow, the one that we serve, guess what? He's a servant. And here's the other benefit of them serving. As they serve, they grow. They grow in compassion. They grow in empathy. They grow into discovering, oh, I really enjoyed this. I really enjoyed adding value to somebody else's life. So can we teach them to serve? Can we get them back involved in things that don't serve them? Because everybody going to be an NBA star. Everybody going to be an NFL player. Right? Everybody going to be the next rap artist, musician, all of that. Everybody going to be a TikTok famous and YouTuber. Everybody's going to do that. Right? So can we involve them in things that don't center around them, but instead say, no, 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 we're going over here, and we're going to help out some people we don't know just because that's who we are. That's how we help them to discover the purpose that God has placed on the inside of them. And then last thing in this space, and then I'll move on to my last point. Um, can we start developing them as leaders? So this one, this one, this one, this one cut me at the core, cut me at the core. Because there's a reminder, I was talking to one of my friends, uh, you all heard him, Pastor Elliot Renfro, and uh, talked to him several months ago, and I was talking to him about, hey man, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, just this reality that, you know, time is, time is not guaranteed. I need to start planning for succession. I need to start, you know, preparing, developing, discipling people around me because somebody's got to take my place. And I'm aware that somebody got to take the places of other people, right? And, 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 and Pastor Renfro, in his wisdom, he is so wise. He does so much in my life, right? He just raises questions. He said, Hub, how old were you when you started pastor? I said, 26. He said, who are the 26-year-olds around you? I said, oh. I said, oh. He said, oh, God trusted you at 26. That means God was preparing you before you were 26. So who are the 20-year-olds and the 18-year-olds, and how are you developing and pouring into them now? Right? So I just want to press it on. As, as parents, if we're going to affirm that there is purpose in you, purpose don't have to wait till you're 40. It's all right. I told you, I ain't come for class today. I just came to get what I got, right? All right? So, so, so how, do we, how do we train and release 10 and 12-year-olds and develop them as leaders? See, it's my conviction biblically as I read the Scripture, and I could be wrong, but based on my reading of the Scripture, it appears to me that the disciples were teenagers. Because you become an adult in the Jewish culture at 13. Right? So if you become an adult at 13, and you would be accepted into rabbinical schools between 13 and potentially 20, then those who had not been accepted into rabbinical schools would be Young teenagers that Jesus calls and invites, not 40, 50-year-olds. Wait a minute, Jesus, you potentially poured into and developed teenagers and said to them, go into all the world and make disciples? I know, that rocks your world, doesn't it? Like, I always thought they was like 50 and 60. Remember, none of them were married, Peter. He was probably the oldest of the bunch. Jesus poured into young people, and he was the rabbi. So what happens if because we believe young people have purpose that we stop waiting until they're 20 
okay? I can see y'all struggling with this. So let me just rewind our history. How many of you who communicate learned how to communicate at 8 and 9 in your local church giving Easter and Christmas speeches? How many of you who lead learn how to lead being the president of the junior usher board and the junior choir? How many of you learn how to navigate and count money because they allowed you to go to the classes and pick up the Sunday school money and then count the Sunday school money and tally the Sunday school money and then present the report? That was leadership development. That was in my church history. Just wave your hand if that was your church history. So some of us remember that. Y'all, we were kids. But they knew we had purpose in us. Now, that means if we're going to value the fact that they got purpose, we got to make room for them. Don't be mean, mean to your neighbor, online or in person, but tell them that means you might have to get out the way. If we're going to make room for them, that means you might need to get out the way. That means you might need to do what you're doing less so you can coach and develop them so they can do it a little bit. Because they can't do it a little bit if you stay at the pace you're at. Are y'all hearing me? Because I'm giving you my heart today. Right? And I was like, Whoa, what are you talking about? What's going to come next? I just want you to hear, if we're going to affirm that they have purpose, then we need to treat them like they have purpose. Which means they need responsibility at home and in church and in life. Here's my last point. We finally want to affirm you are not alone. You are not alone. Here's what, what Jesus does for the disciples as he talks to them. He goes on to talk about, hey, if you're going to own me in front of people, man, I'm going to, like, that's my boy in front of God. You're going to diss me in front of people? I'm like, I don't know them either. Right? And what, 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 what Jesus is basically saying is I'm with you. I got you. You're not by yourself. And we need to affirm to our children, you're not alone. You're not alone. You're not alone. God is with you. I am with you. And one of the reasons that I bring you to church is for you to be in community with other people who have Christ-centered values who are with you. That's why I bring you to community. So that when you don't see me, you can see some folk who are invested in you because they know God got a plan for your life. They know that God values you. They know that God loves you. And because they know that, then they want the best for you. You are not alone. So when they talk to you, respond to them better than you would respond to me because they're looking out for you. Why do we need to affirm to our children you're not alone? Because they feel so alone. They feel abandoned. So we want to affirm them, you're not by yourself. I know, I know, I don't know what's going on in your head. I don't always know what's going on in your heart. I don't always know all the details of what's happening at school. But I just want you to know, you're not alone. God is with you. And even the things that I don't see, God sees. And because God sees, God promises that he will intervene. So I want to encourage you because God is with you. I want you to know that you can talk to God about stuff that you can't talk to me about. Why do I want you to know that? Because I need you to know at a young age that we serve a God who is faithful. That we serve a God who can be trusted. That we serve a God that you can rely upon, that you can count upon. So when you feel overwhelmed and you feel as though the world is against you, here's my affirmation for you, my child. You are not alone. And... I need you to hear this, my child. If God be for you. Is there anybody know the word in the house? If God be for you. 
He's more than the whole world against you. You are never outnumbered when God is on your side. (laughs) So it was tight, but it was right. It was hard, but do you hear it? Our children need our affirmation. And some of us, we don't have small children anymore. We need to pick up some other children. <laughs> I'm serious. I remember Miss Neely. Miss Neely was next door neighbor to my big mama on 27th Street in East St. Louis, Illinois. Miss Neely would sit on the porch, tavern up the street to the left, whole bunch of activity going on at the tavern. But Miss Neely would sit on the porch. And as she sat on the porch, Miss Neely's watching. If we go to the left, Miss Rogers was two doors to the left. And Miss Rogers would sit on the porch in the afternoon, early evening. And if we went that way too far, Miss Rogers was watching. See, we always knew that there were a community of people who were looking out for us. None of them gave birth to us, none of them were a part of our family. But they saw it as their responsibility to look out for us. So if your children are grown, take on some. Love on your grandchildren. Love on your great-grandchildren. If you don't have children, take in some. Love on some. Nurture them. Encourage them. Why? Because for many of our children, nobody's affirming them. Nobody. And if nobody tells you that you are loved, if nobody tells you that you are valuable, and nobody tells you that you have purpose, and nobody tells you that you are not alone, how do you expect me to act? I'm angry at the world. Nobody loved me because nobody's telling me. Nobody's telling me I'm valuable. Nobody's telling me I have purpose. Nobody's telling me I'm not alone because I am alone. How do you expect me to act? It's our privilege in this season and this time to love on not just our children, but the children of our community. So I'm done. What are the four affirmations we're going to tell children? They are. They are. They have. They are not. Thank you. 